Welcome to the Cabin Culture Podcast, where we spend a little more time diving deeper into all the fun parts of cabin culture. We like to think of this as both the material and imagined expressions of how cabin lovers, dwellers, builders, designers, and dreamers wish to live a more simple and authentic life. On this episode, Janice, Justin, and I start with a little check-in to see what's been going on at Chalet and Cozy Rock before welcoming on this week's guest, Devin Laura. He's just completed a two-year journey of building a shipping container style escape in the Pacific Northwest, aptly named the Pacific Bin. Devin's dedication to capture and share the build process from the very beginning with honesty and transparency translated to three quarter of a million people following along, opening up creative outlets for funding, partnerships, and future project opportunities. He shares with us all the ups and downs of tackling this project at times completely by himself and what kind of person that takes. All that and more on this episode of Cabin Culture. Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, I'm doing smiles for you, Janet. Oh, thank you. Sorry, you guys, you can't see that if you're at home, but Sean has a big smile on, which is not always common. <laughs> so how's the chalet frame going? You know what I realized when I was listening back to the podcast that I think I say it wrong every time. I say chalet frame, and I think it's supposed to be chalet frame. You did say it wrong, Janice, but it's fine. Okay, it's well, I'm fixing word. it. It's it a weird it's word. more French and fancy. I like it. I know the chalet frame sounds like it's just a little bit fancier <laughs> and like, I know what I'm talking about. So tell me, how is the chalet, chalet frame doing? Glad you asked. We have our uh, generator getting installed today. We're running the propane line as we speak in the that wet. Is cold. Exciting. Yeah. <laughs> we have a guest checking in at four. So our guy promised he'd be out of there by then. No pressure. Mm -mm. No pressure. So they already got it on site like last week and the electrician hooked up the panel, uh, everything else. And now today they're running the gas line from our underground tank to that generator, which will fuel it. So pretty impressive. You did that so quickly in February. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we've just been lucky so far. We did have some pretty significant power outages around Christmas and New Year's, which made yep. us immediately jump to this decision. And we figured... I don't know. It could be one of those like, what is it? What do they call it? Like first springs or like faux spring. And then like, we all think we're out of winter, but then winter hits us even worse. And so we're not out yet. So we could get some more big storms and we just want to want to be ready. Well, and we've lost power, honestly, in the summer before too. Yeah. Now oh, I will before. say the consequences of that are not nearly as severe, but still it would be nice yeah. for guests that they didn't have to deal with that. We had yeah, so. smaller power outages too. Like that would just, knock the clock out and had to reset the clock every and i mean that's not bad we don't know how long those lasted but every time we'd go up there to check the clock would need to be reset so we'd know it's out yeah such a little thing but still you don't want guests to have to do that so having a generator means you don't need to worry about it so much um can i ask how much that cost you oh you sure can it was ten thousand five hundred dollars <laughs> okay that's about we paid nine thousand up at the lake and i've been like trying to figure out if it's time at cozy rock but we have not done it yet yeah, I don't think there's ever a right time to spend ten thousand dollars, but we figured I don't know. We just bite the bullet and the guy's on it though. Like Justin said, we have an opportunity to install it, and I was like, okay. So when we think in like spring, and he's like, no, you can hop in there in like the next two weeks and make it happen. So that's crazy. So I think technically, I mean, I should have asked the off, you know, the grid, the off grid guys we just had on our, our last podcast there, if this makes us technically off the grid. I mean, I think as long as we have propane, we're off the grid. We have septic, well, a whole house generator. We have Starlink internet. Can you so be off know. the grid with internet? Maybe we can put like quotes around off. So it's just like, yeah. Okay. Like, we need someone to define off grid for us because to like, me that feels, but you're right. Like if it's self-sustaining, you don't need anything from the town. Then like. If the grid goes out, we're still partying at the chalet. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'll head there because if the grid goes out, I think I'd be in trouble. So how was that? Uh, cozy rock. Uh, Good. Good. I don't think I have anything exciting to report. That's good. That's always just good. Smooth sailing at the moment. You were just up there a week ago? 
a couple days yeah. ago. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago. And then we ended up canceling our March trip. So we're not going back up until May, which will be the longest time period that we have spent away from the cabin since we built it. But oh, we're yeah. traveling to Banff in a week or two to go skiing. And then our honeymoon is in April to Argentina for two weeks. So fitting a trip in in March just felt like we wanted some downtime. So That's we'll awesome. see how it goes. Those sound like two awesome trips. Do you guys ski a, a lot or you're just kind of casual skiers? No, I grew up skiing with my dad and then in my adult life moved to North Carolina. So don't ski much at all. Um, once a year when I go up to Maine, I'll usually go to Sugarloaf and ski. So just enough to like remind myself. But I think my dad wants to get me back into it because for my birthday last year, he got me skis and then this year got me boots. So I have a whole new set. <laughs> And he's now retired, so he goes out on a big trip every year for like three weeks and invites us to come for a week of it. In the last two years, because of COVID, we had to bail both times. So we're finally doing it. And then down to Argentina just to explore? You got like a plan? Well, my best friend works for the State Department, and she nice. was stationed in Guadalajara and then Tunisia. And my mom was sick when she was in Guadalajara and then COVID hit when she was in Tunisia. So I've yet to visit her and she's in Buenos Aires right now. So oh, perfect timing. <laughs> yes. So we're going down there and staying with her the first week we'll do in Buenos Aires. And then the second week, so she's planning the first week, the second week we're going to Patagonia and I am planning the Whoa. second week. So I booked one Airbnb and one hotel and I've planned all of our hikes that Sean is insisting he will not come on. <laughs> you think so you wish me luck. Do you think you would wear a Patagonia shirt down there? Or do you think you'd feel like a poser as I thought cross your mind? Cause I feel like I would be holding my Patagonia t-shirt and saying, well, I can't bring this. There's no way I can put this shirt on and go to Patagonia. That's that ridiculous. thought had not entered my mind, well, but if I, have to, if I have to remove all my Patagonia clothes, I might not be left with anything that I can wear. Well, L.L. Bean will like do me good, but Patagonia yeah, go. is like the bulk of my stuff. <laughs> what now a good it's in your head. You're welcome. <laughs> but listen, like Sean and I are the ones who buy hats at L.L. Bean and then proudly wear them before we've even checked out at the store. So we're not really afraid of, you know, wearing the band T-shirt at the concert. Uh, if you oh, will. There you go. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's about all. Exciting. Hey there. <laughs> What's going on, guys? How are you? Uh, thanks for joining us. It's such a last minute notice. <laughs> Sorry for uh, mixing up my time zone. <laughs> you are totally fine. As soon as I, I like should think about this more often ahead of time. And I always think of it the moment that we're supposed to start recording. I'm like, oh shit, are they in a different time zone? <laughs> well, I'm we glad you're here. Up. Yeah, yeah, good to be here. So tell us where you're located right now. Yeah, so I personally live in Redmond, Washington. It's like 10, 15 minutes outside of Seattle. Um, but we built the, built the bin out. It's probably like an hour away from Seattle, um, right off of it's highway two. It's like one of the main highways that stretches into the mountains. So yeah. Well, nice That's to meet awesome. you. I'm Janice. This is Sean and Justin. Sean just turned his video off because he's our producer. Um, but he's still <laughs> here listening. <laughs> oh, he's back. So cool. What up, Sean? How's it going? Justin. Just so you how know are who you guys? all is here. <laughs> and how many Justin episodes and in are you? you? How many episodes in are you guys? I was just making our episode. I don't know if you all saw this on our podcast group note, but I was making the episode order and it appears this is episode 10. Oh, double oh, digits. 11. I'm sorry. Your number 11. Awesome. <laughs> so nice. we've officially made it past 10. So we're learning and growing. <laughs> um, they're Congrats, getting better guys. each That's time. Awesome. <laughs> I don't know if we actually are, but we tell ourselves we're getting better. So. I think we are the last yeah, two yeah. that I, that we've recorded have felt spectacular, but who knows how other people will feel, but yeah, for me, I, I watched it was the, Le the Levi Kelly one. And that was, that was awesome. He's, yeah. He's a really cool, cool dude too. Yeah. Cause you all are in the same space. So tell us, um, for folks who don't know who you are, if they're not one of the almost a million people following you on Instagram, um, tell them who you are and what you do. Yeah, so my name is Devin Lorup, and I just built the Pacific Bin, which is a shipping container home uh, about an hour outside of Seattle. Um, yeah, right after college, 
what, four or five years, well, it's already been like five years now. Yeah, five years ago, um, right after I got out of school in Michigan, I just, I've always wanted to live by mountains and all my family's from the Midwest. And I'm just like, I need, need to go West. I need to live by the mountains and just sent it. So my mom and I took a road trip out like through Canada and then I just <laughs> stayed in Seattle. So moved to Seattle five years ago. Okay, wait, um, did you have a job there or you were just like, nope, I'm going to find a place to live and I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Nice. Okay, just deeply like, respect I, that. I was, I like, I had one friend out here that I knew through school. So I lived in, in his parents' like study, which is like a nine foot by nine foot study. I had a little air mattress on the ground while I'm trying to find an apartment, trying to find a job. I had like $3,000 to my name at that point. That's awesome. So yeah. Um, but I mean, the Seattle, Seattle job market is super hot. So I was coming out here with an engineering degree. Um, so I figured it's just a matter of time. So I ended up. How long a job. did it take you? It was, oh, it was like four, four weeks, I think. So that's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, I was, that, that was my full-time job. Just sitting at Starbucks every single day, 12 hours a day. Like I'm going to go find a job. So I ended up landing a killer job at, um, it's a general contractor. So I work as a project engineer. Uh, we build like high rises, downtown Seattle and like multi-family homes and all, all the big stuff you see in Seattle skyline photos. <laughs> nice. So yeah. Um, after, so I landed that job. That's, that was sort of like my slow and steady income. Um, and my side hustle, side hustle and passions was film and photography. I just, I love creating just aesthetic things, things that like inspire people, things that make you feel something. Um, mm -hmm. So just like when I was like with the undertone of knowing that I wanted to make money with film and photography and could potentially see myself going into that full time. So I started growing my media business, which in Washington, it's a lot of fun because you just every weekend you bomb out into the mountains. You just, I don't know, it's just a really good time shooting for brands and just get to hang out with friends in these crazy locations. So I started growing my media business, um, like like I said, with the undertone of making money with it. So I knew I wanted to funnel that money into something. Didn't know exactly what that looked like. I knew real estate was somewhere in the future for me, like getting involved with real estate. Um, couldn't, I could not for the life of me bring myself to wanting to buy like a single family home. It was just like, <laughs> it was very unattractive to me. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, about two years ago over Christmas time, I was back in Chicago over Christmas and, um, we, we sort of came up with the idea of shipping container homes where I saw the box hop, which obviously blew up and I'm like, oh, this could be perfect because back in high school, I worked as a welder. Um, and my dad pretty much forced me to be a welder so that I would stay out of trouble in high school. Um. <laughs> So I knew how to do all sorts of steel work and just honestly love the aesthetic of shipping container homes. Yeah. So two, two years ago, I'm, I just decided I'm like, we're, we're going to do this. So my mom's a designer back in Chicago. Um, and we really just baked through a design for what is now the Pacific bin. Um, yeah. One thing led to another, I was able to sock enough, sock away enough money, um, to like fund this thing or to, <laughs> not fully fun, but at least open up a line of credit and get this thing rolling. Yeah. Tell us about that a little bit. I hate to jump right into money, um, but that's like often one <laughs> what of people the people want to hear. I know. And I was a dreamer for so long and like had a tiny little savings account for a cabin. And, you know, I, the only reason I ended up doing it was because my mom passed away and left me some money. Right. But that's like not what you hope for or what's common. So I think had that not happened, I don't know how I would have gotten where I am now. And so you're young and got there so quickly. Tell us how you pulled that off. Okay. So part of it was you were working full-time and running a media company. So that made it probably easy to save some of that money. What else did you do when you decided it was time? Yeah. Well, also a big part of that was I invested a chunk of my savings early on into Tesla, which paid off big time. They just nice. like, Okay, I did like, not see it that like coming. 10x my money. That was <laughs> I, I've always been like a huge Tesla fanatic. I convinced my dad to get one like seven or eight years ago. And I just like followed that company like nobody's business. And I put uh it was like 
it was like 10 or 15 grand in like right off the bat probably in 28 17 18 um and it like i think it was like nine times my money which was Jeez. able to get me out of having my like college beater truck so i was able to buy a tesla because i mean i was gonna say only a car here in tesla. washington <laughs> yeah, so i got a, a model y which was like my dream at the time um and it also it they save you so much money out here just paying for electricity not gas um but yeah so i got that and it was also able to sock away like the extra half of my down down payment so i put a hundred and fifteen thousand dollars my own money into the bin itself, which opened up a $600,000 line of credit, which is where I'm sitting like just below right now. I'm sitting at like 572 on my line of credit. So all in the bin was just shy of 600 grand land included. No, the Can line I of ask? credit. Oh. oh yeah. Go ahead, Justin. I just had a question. So line of credit. So were you not able to get like a traditional 30 year mortgage or did you have to go a different route in the lending world? Yeah. Yeah, so I was able, to, funding was a, a tricky one. So it took me a while because banks won't even entertain the idea. They're like, you want to go drop a bunch of boxes in the forest and have people stay in there? That's what I was <laughs> Have just fun, thinking. dude. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I ended up uh, meeting with a group of private investors and was able to negotiate some loan terms. Um, they're pretty aggressive. So <laughs> I have... 10 years to pay the thing back, but I'll almost likely re refinance. And um, now that the home is like fully permitted, it's it's not just like a structure. That I'm just like, oh, let's go build something. I, I went through all the steps to fully permit the home. It meets every energy code, all the I's you got to dot and T's you got to cross for the state of Washington. So I think now that I'm done with it, I'm going to go get it appraised, get it re refinanced and pay down that line of credit. and get a normal 30, 30 year you think they're gonna comp your box house like they would any other 1500 square foot home or would they, how do you think that's gonna go are you kind of crossing your fingers they're uh open-minded and just appreciate how nicely you built this place yeah that's i don't see why they wouldn't appraise it just like any other home i mean durability wise like this thing would smoke any other home like earthquake like Oh, yeah. I mean, we don't have like tornadoes and stuff out here in, in Washington, but I don't see why it wouldn't be appraised at that. We we did the thing a hundred percent true, like full metal roofs, like the closed cell spray foam, like it's built to Washington code. And I don't see why, <laughs> hopefully why it wouldn't be approved or uh, appraised that just like a traditional home. And this is yeah, a new problem awesome. that banks are having to reconcile with. I don't know if it, who it's a problem for, but like there are more non-traditional homes being built, tiny houses, things like that, and figuring out appraisal for that, especially if at the time that you refinance, you have a proven rental record. I don't know if they keep that. Like, do they account for that? Do you know, Justin? What's that? Uh, it, did I cut out? I was a little choppy oh. on my side. Okay. <laughs> um, Like I, I would think that banks have to be thinking about this because so many people are now exploring like alternative ways to build um would they take into account if devin's been renting it let's say for a year at the time of refinance would they take that rental income into account when thinking about the value of it or that doesn't really matter i guess i mean i think it depends on how he would look at it if it would be like a commercial loan you know like as an investment property or just like a single family three bed two bed or you know whatever the specs are that would matter. Obviously, if it's just a single family, they wouldn't really care how much money you're making. Yeah, I actually, I met with a uh, another private investment firm. They reached out a couple of weeks ago regarding future projects, and they mentioned that you should have the, I guess, the home, but the home valued as like a business. So they said, get a year under your belt, be able to prove what it is or what your what your revenues and profits and all that stuff are, and then factor that as a multiple of what your business brings in. And they said, nine out of 10 times, it's going to be significantly higher valued one than what the actual home is itself, which right. brings into another thing. How do you also value the, I guess, like social media presence of a home? Right. Because if you sell that business, like you are no longer managing that. So it's, it's, it's like this gray area. And that's how do you value that? 
I would be surprised if banks would, would take that into consideration. But, but they're going to have it's, to, though. I mean, it's huge. It's it's almost everything at this point. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're going to have to start accounting for social media following, I do think. Because, like, Trot Cottage, who had, like, a ton of followers. I mean, at the time when I started following them, it was, like, 50,000. I was like, that's so many. And they sold a technically one-bedroom, not winterized cottage on a lakefront for over a million dollars. It was like 1.3 million or something. And I'm certain part of that was because real estate prices just don't live in a vacuum anymore. And all of these things like rental history, Instagram, social media, YouTube presence, like do change the value of a home. Yeah, I just don't know how the old people at the bank are going to figure that all out. It's, it's going to take a bit, but the banks that are willing to innovate, I guarantee are going to make a lot of money on it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Justin, how did you all, do you mind me asking how you all financed the chalet frame? Yeah. I mean, we went pretty uh, traditional route. Uh, just, we went through a bank uh, that way and we just brought the down payment. We had obviously purchased the land initially. Uh, so we own that obviously free and clear, like most banks require. I'm not even sure who even lends on land that some people do. You can uh, so, Norway savings yeah. could, yeah, but it helps. Definitely. Yeah, it helped the deal I got because I had bought the land as well. But they had asked, like, if you can get a construction loan or something on all of it, I think. Yeah, so we just did that. We did a construction loan that turned into a permanent loan after we were done. We had the land owned free and clear that helped towards the down payment. And we went that route. And when we wrapped and it when all it up, came, we converted. How many, how many acres are you guys on? Uh, we have two, Where's exactly. Yeah, okay. two, which is what we just needed. Just one, one, one home, right? Yep. One home on two acres. That's what the, the town of Stratton required. So we just got by with two acres on the dot, roughly. I mean, it's marked right. with stone walls. So <laughs> plus or minus a half an acre, maybe. Okay. Now when it came, this question is for both of you, but when it came to the like furnishing, because the thing about construction loans is that it only covers like everything that you're using to build it. But then there's still like, once you finish building it, there's still, especially for a rental, like all the furnishing and decorating and like all the other expenses that go into it. If you have a hot tub, like that's not part of a construction loan. How did you all finance all of those outside of mortgage expenses? Yeah, so for the bin specifically, I, well, since I had just a private line of credit, it's it's wide open to fund really whatever parts of construction all the way down to the furnishings. But um, for, fortunately, growing this Instagram size of the, or growing the Instagram to the size that it is now, um, I had a fair amount of companies reaching out that were willing to either pay me to promote their stuff or just give me free stuff like my love sack couch um, it's like a $12,000 couch they sent over and it's just insane. It's loaded with speakers and everything, but yeah, they sent it in exchange for uh, a few Instagram reels. Which, wow. Uh, <laughs> That's not amazing. Yeah, so the, po po the power of social media, but yeah, which is uh, something else I want to touch on. So let's go back to that in just a second, Justin, how did you all furnish all that or, uh, fund all that? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's where kind of things get a little tricky, I guess, if you're going the traditional route, because they kind of ask for like, when you ask for a disbursement at certain milestones, I mean, they, you somewhat have to let them know, like, you know, some invoices and like what you did at that milestone, but obviously, you know, you can't track everything. So, you know, if you have invoices that were maybe lesser that month and you can, you can buy some furniture ahead of time and you can kind of mix and match everything, but <laughs> it kind of just, there's a lot of juggling, I guess, when you're just trying to make it all work out on a, on a traditional construction loan. Uh, and then just cash, you know, obviously throughout, if it took a year to build, we're just kind of buying things with cash here and there too, or credit yeah. cards, we open up a credit card, you can do that. That's a fun little trick. Some of them offer you like 0% for like a year or something and tricks like that, but you get creative for sure. Go uh, no, that was one thing I absolutely did not budget for it. At least it, I did budget for, but not to the extent that it actually takes to furnish a home. I thought it was like 15 grand in and it is so much more than that well your couch was 12 so <laughs> <laughs> but it cost zero <laughs> but that's that's just so, an experience yeah. thing because this is your first house right yeah i grossly well, underestimated couch. with my first one and then with cozy rock came a lot closer and then with our third one 
which we just did with my sister, we were actually under budget. And now that doesn't necessarily mean we like spent less. It just means that I budgeted more appropriately. I actually knew what the costs of everything were, but that felt like a win to me. I was like, okay, I finally have a grasp on like (laughs) realistic costs for all these things. And you know, just, just takes doing it more than once, I think to figure that out. If you're dreaming about a cabin build, or are in the midst of a build, or you just bought a place and are getting ready to host for the very first time. Regardless of where you are, sometimes you just need a little help along the way. Shared experiences from someone who's been there, advice from someone who's learned a lot of lessons the hard way, that's me, or a cheerleader as you finish up. All of these reasons are exactly why I started offering cabin consultations to our Instagram followers and friends who could use some specific one-on-one help. I can't promise to solve all your problems, but I can promise to be transparent about our build costs and process, our organization and project management systems, our favorite and least favorite tools for renting, how we market, and how we found ourselves with almost 80,000 Instagram followers and 100% occupancy in our first year of hosting at Cozy Rock. So if that sounds like it might help you, feel free to visit us at staycozycabin.com or on Instagram at Cozy Rock Cabin and sign up for a time to chat there. That out. Okay, so let, let's talk uh, briefly or not so briefly about the social media following because something that a lot of folks talk about when it comes to hosting is not relying on platforms as the sole marketing source for your property. And while it seems unlikely that Airbnb is going to all of a sudden go bankrupt and disappear, it is possible. It is possible that that could happen with BRBO. And so um, when you started your social media, was that top of mind or did you start it just because you like capturing things and that's like who you are and what you do? Yeah, it was sort of a combo of both. I I mean, leading into the project, I had watched podcast after podcast after podcast, YouTube videos, all sorts of things saying the power of social media audience, which being in the filmmaking business in the first place, I already like, like obviously had seen the power of it. So I knew going into it, I'm like, I have this killer story to tell. Like a lot of mistakes people make is like, once the home's done, then they start telling, (laughs) telling the story, like all the, oh, look at all this pretty thing. It's like what people really engage with and can follow is a story and that's like storytelling is huge on social media so going into it i knew filming this whole process was going to be a large part of it i had a goal of having a hundred thousand followers by the end of 2022 which <laughs> just blew that out of the water i did which was sort of a testament to me filming it but also instagram's totally pivoting their algorithm to fit like the TikTok short form video format. Yes. Um, so yeah, going into it, Instagram reels were just like popping off from the beginning. Um, yeah, I guess like one of my, I guess, tricks with my Instagram reels is I would time lapse everything, right? So it takes like five, I did most of the construction myself. So it takes five minutes out of the day to just set up a time lapse and move move the camera every few minutes just to get different angles just to keep the viewers attention constantly moving mm-hmm. but yeah just packing as much content into like the shortest format possible is what i found worked the best and like popped off the most so like any of my instagram reels with a window falling out of the house as i'm cutting it out just blows up because people are like oh like they can see so much happening you know yeah. um but yeah, just ultimately being able to tell that whole story. Like I think I, so I paid for renters early on um, before we even started building the home, which I think was a huge reason the home really started to grow. Cause I could show mm. people what I'm aiming for. Like you have to paint that picture for them. You really do. Cause a lot, most people don't have that ability to see your vision. If you like, that's right it's worth paying a grand or two for, for renders. So, um, yeah, over just like the course of the 10 month build process, I just time-lapsed everything, grabbed trending audios and just stitched it all together and tried to tell the story best as possible. (laughs) Yeah. And, oh, go ahead, Justin. No, I was just blown away that that, I mean, it worked out so well, so fast. That's insane. I mean, you have what? 750,000 followers now, right? Is that right? Something like that. Plus or minus probably (laughs) 10,000. 
in the engagements of last year, it's they said the little like end of year report. It said the engagements was over like 121 million unique accounts from last year. <laughs> like those are stupid numbers. It yeah. just doesn't even make sense. Yeah, it does but. make sense. All the things you were just saying though is that I think the reason and and you know when people give credit to Instagram because the algorithm changed, which is real, it did, and that definitely helped people willing to use Reels. But the reason the algorithm changed is because we like Reels better. Even the people complaining about having to make Reels, I would get, like bet that they're spending more time watching Reels than they are anything else, and that's why the algorithm is doing what it's doing is because that's the format that humans like. And so I also run a video production company. And so it's interesting that both of us went into the projects immediately with a mindset of like, I just have to tell a story around this. And I think that's where reels make it so much easier than just a post to tell that story as you're doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, I mean, even when they started like the creator bonus program on Instagram, where you can actually start making money through it. (laughs) <laughs> like, like, oh crap! I can move the t- I can move the camera around a few more times if this will help fund the thing. <laughs> Which is smart because well, if they wanted to pivot the platform to video and they give that incentive, like I'm sure you make a ton more than I do, but I make like 150 dollars a month just for creating reels, which I would do anyway. So well, we just go to like one nice dinner every month, and I'm like, thank you, Instagram. Like, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. Hold on, how cool do you have to be to get this uh, invitation to the? No, I think anybody can. I don't think I got an invitation. I think you just have to be a creator or a business. Business hmm. account, and you're in. Yeah, and you just ha- you have to sign up for it, and you have to sign up for it every month, and then you have to remember on- when you're publishing a reel to make sure that you click real play. Cause like the one that we just had go viral this last week of Sean pretending to barf on an airplane is at 2 million views. And I forgot to add it to reels bonuses. No. Oh, dang. That's it's worth fine. like what? Five or 600 bucks. No way. The way that they reward mine is like, I've had ones go viral before and they only, they call them bonus plays. So it's only like certain, certain numbers of those plays count. Who knows? It could have been more, but I, I totally so, forgot to click the button. <laughs> for those who don't understand, like, like what is, so how does this work? So you, if you have a creator page or a business page, you just create a reel, then what? And then they pay for it. You, Devin, I'm going to grab my phone. If you remember how you signed up for it, I'm going to look and see if I can figure it out. So I'll let you explain it okay. first. Yeah. So the way the creator bonus program works is that you have, so at the start of every month, Instagram starts tracking all the reels that you produce. So the the goal, their goal is to get you to create as much content as possible to just keep, keep the platform going and keep people interested. Um, I think you can make up to like 150 reels a month. And over that 30 day process, they, collect all of the views that you have and it's like the views from the first 24 hours are worth more than the views that you make over the remaining 30 days or 20 whatever however much time is left in the month so um yeah they pretty much just reward you for your views but a little trick is make sure to post right right at the start of the month or like load the front of the month so that all your reels can keep collecting views because if you post a reel on like the 30th and the the like the real what do you call it like the timeline expires on the 31st you only get paid for those like however many thousand views but really you should just be posting reels every day so pretty much (laughs) okay so you go on instagram and you click on your profile and then you go to settings and then when you're in settings like the third one down at least on my version will say either like business or creator or what does it say on yours justin Third one down says creator. I'm a creator. So yeah. Okay. So click on creator and then click on bonuses and tell me what it says on your screen when you click on bonuses. I don't even have that option to click bonuses. So am I not part of the club? This is awkward. (laughs) Well, this is awkward. All right. (laughs) Sorry, guys. I guess they do roll them out. Not all at once. My 3000 followers will uh, (laughs) sign off now. Keep an eye on it though, because it will show up and you will get rewarded for them. And it's not like big money. I'm sure Devin makes a lot more because he gets a lot more views, but even for a smaller account, like it's some money. <laughs> it can't we'll hurt. check it out. Yeah. One yeah. nice dinner a month. It, that's all I need. <laughs> there was one point in the summer where I was like in the heat of cutting windows out and everything. And I was like, that was when I was at the peak of engagement and 
I, I got one one check for eighty five hundred dollars. Hell yeah! And I was freaking blown away. I'm like, this just paid for my septic field. <laughs> What? Okay, so that what? is a very different level than my $150 dinners, but that's amazing because you are putting in so much work into this and to get some sort of compensation back for the time yeah, absolutely. is amazing. Yeah. Hell yeah. Good work, Devin. I love that for you. <laughs> um, okay, so again, can I ask you another question about, well, okay, this is not going to be as helpful to the people. I'm curious about it, so I'm going to hold off on that one. But what other tips would you have for folks? Because I find it interesting, you've worked in video, so I, I get that you're more comfortable with like what to document and how to tell a story. But a lot of people who work in video aren't great in front of the camera. But you also put yourself in front of the camera a lot, which I think is intimidating for a lot of people and a barrier. Do you think that that had something to do with how quickly you grow and how successful you've been on YouTube and Instagram? 1000%. Like mm -hmm. you, like you're telling that story, like you are the main character in the story. If, if you're building a home or doing something like that, like, I mean, anyone can go watch a wall get built or a roof put on. But if you're the one telling them like, Today, I absolutely kicked my butt. I was sitting on the roof, it was pouring rain and just had to get this done or something like that. Like people want to engage with you and see the emotional stress you're going through. You would like celebrate your wins with you. Like you're the main character yes. in the story. <laughs> like own so it. So well put. It's, it's awkward. At, it, it's really awkward at first, but if you can just put yourself through like two weeks of it, it'll feel totally natural and you'll just it's still it's still weird for me talking in front of other people like most of the time I was out there either by myself or like with <laughs> friends I'm super close with but like having my electrician running around and being like all right guys today we're yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> which is a Feels reality a little bit different yep. yeah but I think yeah. that's so you true it. it's worth it yeah I mean I follow a bunch of cabins on Instagram for obvious reasons and um there are so many of them that I will forget the name of or I have no idea who's behind it I don't feel emotionally connected to them I love seeing the pictures and I'm so much more engaged in that content yeah and that's where I yeah. guess that's where we lacked on our page and uh as a result Janice made us drive all the way to Freeport Maine to visit her in person uh because we never introduced <laughs> ourselves in the digital space so that's anyway, right. <laughs> we learned our lesson and we won't do that again. No, you're still not on camera enough, <laughs> We're still not on camera. We didn't learn our lesson. I'm kidding. I told him I followed them from the beginning of their build and I thought it was a very interesting threesome situation they had going on. I just really wasn't clear on like who are all, wait, are there two of them? Are there three? Are they married? What is happening? So listeners now, don't make that mistake. <laughs> it's just more fun. And then I will say, we've mentioned this on the podcast a couple of times and folks have come into my DMs and introduced themselves by name. And I do really like that, but I will say it's still hard for me to remember when it's not a human you've met in real life. It's hard to just remember a name and which cabin does that go with, but the people who put their faces on theirs, even if it's just pictures, it's much easier for me to remember. Cause I feel like I've met them and I guarantee that's true for their followers too, and how engaged they oh, are in what's going on. Yeah, there's been so many people I've met through the platform that like, I mean, we send video messages back and forth in DMs. I, I'm kind of really, I kind of get tired of uh, like talking to each other or something like, yeah, almost like the Snapchat, but on Instagram, I don't know. I just get tired of messaging, like texting people all or like just, just typing stuff out. It's like, I'd rather engage with them in, in at least a more natural state. Yes. If that yes. Makes sense. I've never done that with the video. I've, I've had people send me voice DMs and I agree. I like that more than the text because the text is just so impersonal, but now maybe I'll try the video. I love yeah. that. I just learned in the last 10 minutes, I'm doing everything wrong on social media. <laughs> so I'm going to be ready, be ready for the, just for the glow face up in of front of the way. camera. People love it. And you have beautiful images though. You're definitely doing that right. You are working right. with the right photographers and you all take really good images. So you are, you have everything you need. You just need to turn the camera around a little more often. You even have three of you to film each other. You have everything you need, Justin. Thanks for the support guys. But I think what, what, is helpful that that Devin can kind of give everyone is like you have the language of construction because you obviously work for a general contractor. So when you're explaining your estimates and you're running through your numbers, like the way you're talking about construction and planning and pre-construction and all these other things, I think like that's really engaging for people and like they can listen because you know what you're talking about. You're not kind of just pulling numbers out of you know out of thin air. So I think that's super helpful. Yeah. 
And then actually speaking of, of the budget, I noticed some of your videos, you kind of had your estimate there that you're going off of. How did that actually end up turning out for you? Did you, do you think you landed on budget? Or Let's you... talk numbers. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> favorite you, question. You were very confident in your spreadsheet and I was buying into it. And I was like, wow, he's really got this figured out. And you got all these contingencies and these buckets in case you went over. And uh, so how did it all turn out? Tell us. Yeah. So the overall budget was, oh gosh, I haven't watched that video in like a year. It was like <laughs> $550,000 and I'm at 572, which all things considered budget was built in the like before inflation crazy times and I was buying lumber and all that like at the peak pretty much so 22 grand over was not too bad so total coming in at five 572 so I feel pretty good about it yeah I I'm going to be making another video here walking through I'm pretty much doing like a video walkthrough of me breaking down the house from like foundation up and walking breaking down the budget I guess um so it'll be just fun to see what what numbers were higher, what numbers were lower, um, just to sort of be able to refine it for the next one. I mean, are you are you doing this full time now? I am not. No, I still work my engineering job. I worked my engineering job my whole the whole build process. Which okay, you work your engineering job and you run a video production company. Media production is what you call it. I'm sorry, and you built this yourself, and now you're hosting at it. Oh wait, also you've documented all of it on your YouTube channel and your Instagram. Did I get all of it? Am I missing anything? Are you still a welder? <laughs> YouTube, you, you, <laughs> YouTube fell off for sure. I couldn't keep up with the the YouTube grind. Just that that's a lot. Like I I wanted to do it right. If I film for YouTube, I feel like there's a there's a quality level difference between YouTube and Instagram. So YouTube fell off early on. I think my last video was about the foundation. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, no, that's, that's been everything I've been doing. I just, I'm trying to grind early so I can buy a little more time on the back end of my life. So this summer was just absolutely brutal, brutal doing like hundred hour work weeks. I'd get up at four 30 in the morning, get to work by five, get off work at three and work till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. So you would drive there. That was, that was my, you would like go to work and then drive the hour away. I'm glad for you that it was only an hour away and then work on it and then come home and then do it all over again. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then weekends, just 13, 14 hour days, every, every weekend, all summer. So did you, yeah, that was, did you do most of this building yourself? I mean, were you, I mean, it seems like you're hands on, but I mean, was it pretty much everything except for like electrical and maybe plumbing or yeah, everything, uh, MEP, so mechanical, electrical, plumbing, I I subbed that out. Drywall I subbed out just because I can't it finish sucks. a wall to save my life. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do it? No, no. I, I, could, I could patch a hole, but I, I definitely can't hang and tape drywall. I'm not that good. That's an art yeah. form. It's the one it thing really Sean, is. my Sean refuses to do. <laughs> He's like, I can do it, and I refuse because it sucks. <laughs> um, yeah, so... I subbed all those out, but everything, oh, and foundation as well, but everything else besides that, um, my family and I did, my family flew out from Chicago multiple weekends to help out. Mm-hmm. My girlfriend was just huge support in that whole thing, in the whole process. Um, but I did all of the welding myself, stacking of the boxes. Um, I stacked the second floor by myself on like a Friday afternoon. <laughs> I rented a, a forklift and there was just downpouring rain and I chained it up put it on the forklift, threw it on top. I had my drone hovering in the air with the controller sitting next to me. So I could see what's happening and where my like hit marks were, where I need to like keep poking the box on top. And when I got to the right spot, go climb the ladder, go weld the thing solid. And I wasn't even going to ask about doing that part because I figured that's a no brainer. You obviously didn't do that part yourself. And you said (laughs) you did it all by yourself in the woods with a drone as your your guy on the ground. Just you and your uh, shipping <laughs> container and your, what, what did you use to drop it down? Uh, it was, so I got a quote for a crane that was like six or seven grand for a, a day pick because they would have had to bring a whole bunch of bracing with the forest. And it, they just said it was going to be really tricky. So I went to a bunch of different places and they were all like five or six grand for a crane. I'm like, okay, that doesn't fit into my spreadsheet. So I rented a 12 K forklift which is, it, it's pretty much like one of those, those telehandler boom lifts where you can boom out with the box on it. Um, so I rented one of those, like got under it, 
and just chained it up at the corners so it didn't teeter totter too much. You, you can see some of the time lapses on the bins page, but yeah, then I just started driving forward with the box on top. And as soon as in Washington, so it rains a ton. So as soon as I drove off the rock driveway I had, my front tires just started sinking <gasps> oh, like <no. laughs> really, really fast. So, and the box was already like barely teeter tottering on the fork. So it was about to fall off. And I just boomed out as fast as I could and barely landed the container on top of the first floor oh <laughs> before I sunk in the mud completely. Oh my God. And did but, it get stuck? Uh, I had to, <laughs> yeah, it was kind of <laughs> tricky. I had to push, I had to push the forks against the foundation to get myself out of the mud. Nice. Um, yeah, that was one of the most brutal days out there. And it was just downpouring rain the whole time. <laughs> Okay, this is what I'm learning through these conversations is that people, I know this isn't like technically a cabin, so you're a little bit of an outlier in that regard, but people who do this kind of work are a little bit crazy. Would you agree, Justin? Like out of everyone, agree, especially yeah. the last couple of conversations we've had, I'm just like, do you, have you noticed in the people that you've met along the way, Devin, that there's like an element of crazy that we all need in order to like do this? You, you have to, you like, no one just willingly does stuff like this. No one, I mean, I don't know. It's cool. I love meeting people like this that are willing to take a risk and willing to like dive head, like head first into something. It's, I mean, those are the kind of people that I realize I just really engage with and can relate to the most. And it's just like, life is so short. You get, you gotta, gotta live it. You gotta take risks. And yeah. Have you always been like out, this? Some do. Um, I would say so. Yeah. My mom's always said, I've just been a, <laughs> a lot of work as a kid diving into all different kinds of things. And I feel like there's like a level of like self-reliance too, with some of the guys we talked to that go off the grid and they're all by themselves and they got the hatchet, you know, that whole story. But then even you, I mean, to go out and rent a boom all by yourself, and I'm, I'm assuming you've never stacked shipping containers before, but maybe you have, I wouldn't rule that out. Yeah, and then you just go out in the rain and you just, you just boom out this container. And then if it would have missed and fell and your thing got stuck and you're out by yourself, now you got to get yourself out of the mess. I mean, so like, there's a level of like confidence and like self-reliance and you got to be able to just figure <laughs> things out. Like, that's crazy. That's insane that you did that. I felt like I felt there's cool always a solution to everything. And it, so many people can just get so worked up by the what ifs. And it's like mm -hmm. absolute worst case, I have to go rent like a dozer or something to go pull me out. But it's like even more content. There's always a solution to something. <laughs> yeah. Right. Think about the content you can get with that if you had to pull your uh, boom lift <laughs> out of the mud. I mean, that's big, that's big numbers, I bet. <laughs> I feel like you know you're talking to millennials when your response to something really <laughs> bad happening. But guys, it's good content. <laughs> and we're not wrong. Oh, it so is funny. good content. Hey guys, this is Justin from The Chalet. If you're not already listening to this podcast in a cabin or on your way to one, I'd just like to take a second to let you know that our spring calendar is open along with a few winter nights to get that last minute ski trip in before the season ends. I'd also like to remind you that our A-frame comfortably sleeps up to six guests. We're located just 10 minutes to Mount Snow, 15 minutes to Stratton Mountain, and we're surrounded by tons of trailhead access, including the famous Long Trail. Oh, and the food and drink scene here in Vermont is incredible, since most of it's either raised, crafted, caught, or brewed locally, so you definitely don't want to miss out on this. But to learn more, you can find a link to our page in the show notes below. We hope to see you soon, and enjoy the rest of the show. This is why I do think that visual storytellers are really good at social media because that's all it is, is good storytelling. And you were telling that story and I was just totally absorbed in like the mental movie that I was making of like what this all looked like. And I actually just have <laughs> one sp like question about, I guess, building if we're about to pivot off that, I'm not sure. But so obviously a container home, I'm sure you probably never built a container home before. Was there any like special construction methods uh, that you had, that you might have learned maybe the hard way building this for the first time. Obviously, it's not stick framed with plywood and two by four, so maybe a bit of a learning curve or some surprises. For sure, yeah. I mean, there's definitely a lot. Like the plans only get you so far. You do have to figure out a lot of the intricacies on the fly. Um, one one thing which I feel like is becoming common knowledge now is your insulation on shipping container homes has to be a closed cell spray foam. So 
normal insulation is open cell, which means it's it's porous, which works great for traditional homes because having those little air pockets really helps to decrease the transmissibility of temperature through the wall. Um, but with shipping containers and like having steel on the inside, there's that ability for the steel to sweat as you get hot and cold. So that closed cell foam adheres and doesn't have any pores for like that sweating of the steel to like penetrate into. So it pretty much turns the steel and the foam into one system. So that's something, that's one thing I had to figure out like early on because I knew I didn't want to have to deal with water problems down the road, especially living here in Seattle where it rains all the time. Um, and then I think the next thing I would do different is use um, steel studs instead of uh, instead of like normal lumber two by fours that not only increases the uh, what do you call it like your insulation Thermal. value yeah. because if you're able to just feel those those yeah your, your R value you're able to feel those steel fill those steel studs with that foam instead of having to rely on the thermal properties of the wood so and it makes your drywallers life a whole lot easier not having to shim walls or anything like that with bent two by fours because once you spray foam in wood two by fours those things don't you're not able to shift it around with the the drywall going up so they mm -hmm. literally have to shim everything so i'm definitely using studs on or metal studs on the next one so there's a next one <laughs> <laughs> yeah i uh i've been in preliminary talks with a producer for a large network uh, for an eight episode series on a I'm not allowed to say the name, but I'm sure you, <laughs> you can, can probably guess. guess. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're we're pitching to a few different networks right now, but it's it sounds like something will be kicking off at the start of next year. Whoa. Um, which, have you do be... you get to pick where and the design? Like, do they have control over that or do you have control over that? They just said they want really a really cool build out in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm like, game on, let's go. Yeah, you've <laughs> so proven you can it, do it. It's like... <laughs> so, so what are your ideas? How... Oh, um, are you allowed to talk about that? <laughs> I can. Yeah. Okay. I, nice. <laughs> I read, I read we'll keep the it top secret, it I promise. We won't, we won't tell anyone. <laughs> you heard it here first. Go ahead. <laughs> so I would love to utilize as much of the engineering that I've done for the bin on and sort of do a, a play on that so stick with the same first and second floor redesign the inside a, a little bit different of the second floor i really i optimize the bin to be able to pack as many bodies in there as possible so i think it sleeps like seven and is 1600 square feet um i think for the next one i i want to add two 20 foot containers and i want to add them on top to make like a lookout slash library nook with a rooftop deck on top of that. So it gets you, you'd be like 45 feet up in the air. Um, oh. And you'd almost have this like Jenga looking structure where they pivot each way. So like the bin has two forties sticking perpendicular over the bottom three layers. I want to do two more twenties on top perpendicular. So if that makes sense. That sounds amazing. Tower. How many people and will you gold, fit in that one? I think I'm going to stick with the same number of people that will be able to sleep, but just have more like experience type areas of the home, like the library lookout nook. I would love, I, I wanted for my first build to be on the river, but there's like way too many hurdles you had to jump through for permitting and critical areas. And you have to, like with all the snow melt, you get the rivers rise a ton so you have to have all sorts of engineering and piles driven down into the bedrock to be able to make it through that like 100 year floodplain or whatever no big deal so, <laughs> <laughs> so i i've decided to play it a little bit safer and go with the forest vibe for the first one just sort of i was drinking from a fire hose on this first one which was plenty of work so now i feel like i have a little more capacity to do go a little more extreme with the next one do you already have your eyes on a piece of land or are you on the hunt this year for a good piece? I think my girlfriend would kill me if I said I was on the hunt for land. <laughs> uh, but I'm always, always looking, right? I just, I need to take a break this year. Right. I absolutely. Wait, so where, where is this away. new one going though? When they record the show, where is that going to go on the same piece of land? So the, the new one will be on a new piece of land. 
Okay. And I'm going to aim for the river with the new one. But I, it takes a while to get all the paperwork in line with the network is sort of what I'm learning over the last couple of weeks. Um, so it's probably going to be a, a year from now that it'll kick off the next build process, oh, like okay. finding the land. They, they want to be able to film that. What are you looking for in the land? Like, Oh, I um, see. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, just the whole whole process, like episode one will be finding the land. The last episode will be opening it up. Yes. Now, are you going to be allowed to document it on social media because they're capturing it? Yes, that is something I absolutely said, like, needs to be, I need to be able to share all this, just like I did with the bin, um, which they were totally open to. They actually said that networks are sort of transitioning from the old timey ways where <laughs> you're not allowed to share a single thing. If you disclose anything about it, you void your contract and all that. They're almost looking for people with audiences. And they're like, hey, like we can not only utilize this audience, but like help like utilize that to grow ours as well. So That's they're right. seeing the power of social media, which is cool seeing like old time media starting to turn around. See, just like the banks yeah. will be next, just wait. <laughs> we're changing things i do think that's the power of social media because it does feel like a sort of um democratization is that a word but it does put more power into an average person's hands who's like i'm and actually you're not quite average because you're like look at me i'm doing this like really badass thing but previously you would have then if you wanted it to be publicized to the audience that you have built yourself you would have had to convince someone before ever creating it that it was worth documenting. Right. And like, that's a pretty yeah. hard sell kind of like with books before self-publishing, you had to convince a publisher before you even like had something. And now with social media, you were like, I don't need to wait for you. I mean, the TV show followed, which doesn't surprise me, but you were like, I don't need that. I'm going to do it myself and prove to them <laughs> what's possible. I kind of love that. <laughs> it's just all about yeah. skill and storytelling and not so much about like who the old white guys at the top think are worth it. You know? It's yeah. So things. true storytelling is such a powerful thing in, in media and yeah just I, like even with some of my reels like I would go into I, I always tried to go into creating something like um, how do I explain this better I wanted to build a story on the front end so like even when I drive out to the bin in the morning I'd be like all right I'm gonna film this get so many angles or whatever and then here's the audio that I'm gonna match it to just because if you can help to tell that story as a, in like as cohesive as a way possible so just like pre-planning your audio being like okay I need like 10 different clips for this audio that I'm gonna pair it to just like taking those few extra steps really goes the extra mile instead of just like mass filming something and being like what can i pull from this like that definitely works too in some instances but just having a little more intent brings you to that next level this is the difference between what i do for my day job and what i do for the cabin because i do this all day for clients when it came to the cabin i was like i cannot approach this the same way even though i know it's effective so i just like mass shoot and then i'm like i'll figure out what i can make with it later <laughs> <laughs> kind of like, kind of like being like a, a chef, and then having to go home and cook dinner, and you end up just getting takeout or something. You're yeah, like, yeah right. And all day. That's I just insane. did not have the energy. I thought about documenting it all on YouTube, but because of the quality piece, I was like, I can make those videos. I just don't want to after doing it all day. <laughs> um, are you going to document it on the same Instagram? Is that where we'll find you? Yeah, that's been something I've been trying to figure out lately. Is like obviously. 750,000 people and I want to be able to utilize that as much as possible. So I think what I'm going to do is play on the the bin aspect of it. So either call this one like the river bin and sort of like how the box hop does it. I don't know if you've, you've seen their stuff, mm -hmm. but they play on the box hop. Um, so I want to sort of evolve the bin, Pacific bin, coastal bin, like, yeah, that's, that's kind of my, my thought with it. And hopefully if everything goes well with bookings and we like revenue really starts flowing in i can walk away from my full-time job in a year or so and really be able to go all in on youtube as well so if i can just go all in on youtube instagram tiktok i think that's a recipe for some really cool things yeah. I mean, you have the content to do that. You have the skills to do it. There's no reason, but that's, I mean, that brings us to a good point. Hosting, you are a brand new host. Tell us about that oh. experience so far. 
I feel like I could learn a ton from you guys on this front. I that's one one thing that I did not dive into as much as I probably should have, and am sort of learning on the fly right now. I just ended up using Guesty as my property management software. It's it seems like a really great software. They still have some like I can definitely see some areas where they have to learn a bit and grow a bit. Like for example, if you have a direct booking site, they don't have any way to collect reviews after the fact. So I created a Google business and included that in my like, thanks for staying at the bin email. So trying to grow out Google reviews, but it's kind of tricky because often on air, oftentimes like on Airbnb and VRBO, you you go straight to reviews to see what people have said about it. And your direct booking site says nothing. It's like, okay, (laughs) it's this place actually what the photos make it seem are you 100 so, percent direct booking um i have had like one vrbo booking so far which i'm trying to get my first bookings on airbnb and vrbo um, which i don't know if you guys have any insight on starting off on those platforms like do you just drop rates at first to get people in and then because i know out Al- Airbnb is like a largely uh, or not experience based. It's like a satisfaction based algorithm. Yeah, your first ten reviews matter a lot. So, I'm trying to figure out how to get people to book on Airbnb without taking away from my direct booking site. I guess I would say, I mean, if it were me, I wouldn't do direct booking until I have built up enough reviews on, like, just force them to go to Airbnb and just do well. And for me, like, I don't. And I don't know how other people do this, but the incentives for direct booking, it potentially saves guests money. And you could then upcharge if you didn't want to save them money, you could then upcharge whatever Airbnb charges and make more. But as far as mm-hmm. I'm concerned, like then I might as well just go through Airbnb. Like the hassle of direct booking isn't necessarily worth it. And Airbnb is such a large marketplace. So I would, if you want to build up those reviews, just turn off your direct booking for a little bit and and force mm-hmm. them to go through Airbnb and then turn that one off and force them to go to VRBO potentially to just get those first mm-hmm. ones. The other thing that's worth doing when you don't have any reviews is I that's always suggest call. in your title, putting like star new listing, just so people know I don't have any reviews because it's a brand new listing. It's not... Job. It's not that we're not good. And then it feels like, oh, I found something before it's huge, you know, and that has helped get mm. them um, at the beginning, get bookings at the beginning. But it Got depends it. on your market. You should not need to drop rates. You have so many people who are following your build who want to stay there. You have the power to just funnel them towards Airbnb exclusively if you wanted to <laughs> for a little bit of time. Yeah. What's the hesitation? That's, that's a good call. What's the, what's the drive towards, I'm, I'm so unpopular in my opinions. Cause I feel like everyone's pushing people towards direct bookings and I just don't understand it because Airbnb has the accountability piece of like, people have to be verified and have reviews and like, and you can have your own cancellation. What is the, um, help me understand why I should go to direct booking actually. Cause I'm curious, why did you start there? Well, I started with direct booking because I thought building the audience that I had, I would just be able to fully just funnel everyone from there into the direct booking site, um, which I figured if I can save save the overhead off of Airbnb for the guests, like they would appreciate that a lot, which I mean, I've, I've got March like half booked out now and April's probably almost half booked out now as well. So I figured making a little more money on the front end for me and saving guest money is like a win-win, but I'm, I'm starting to realize that I have to constantly market on my Instagram to be able to get more of those bookings. And I would really rather use a company that like a billion dollar company with a huge marketplace to be able mm-hmm. to do that for me. So I'm, I think that's, I think that's going to be a, the approach. I think sort of push it, still leave my direct booking site up or maybe pull it down off the link tree for a few weeks to get a few, few Airbnb bookings and then sort of see where it goes from there. I'm totally new to this whole hosting deal. So it's sort of been a drinking from the fire hydrant <laughs> experience. Yeah. Cause the other thing I would say is hosting like up to seven guests. So I have one property that can fit eight to 10. I have Cozy Rock, which can fit max four, but most of them are couples. And then I have another one that can fit eight to 10. And the the Mm -hmm. first one with eight to 10, I've been hosting at for almost seven years. And I can say that hosting groups is a whole nother beast because 
Really? one person books, but there's six or more people coming with them who don't know you personally, who might not follow you on Instagram, who might have, and there's no accountability for those six other people other than that one friend. And this is only if there's reviews. So if on direct booking, you don't get to review them, then there's no accountability for them and what they do at your place mm. with a group of people. And uh, that's the reason I have avoided direct booking is one Airbnb has backup insurance. We also have our own insurance, but secondly, just the accountability of, they know we'll review them. So at least one person is going to be held accountable when they leave a mess or don't follow checkout procedures or throw a party or whatever it is that they might do there. There's more accountability. That's an aspect I didn't even think about. That's a yeah. great call. Yeah. Groups are just different. I honestly would be way more apt to go to direct booking for cozy rock. Cause we've had like, I mean, almost everyone finds us on Instagram. We, they feel like they have a personal connection to me and do after they stay there. Um, and so yeah. there's that kind of built-in accountability and at worst there's only two or four people. Right. So like how much damage can you really do? But we get like <laughs> a lot of snowboarders and like, you know, you, you can get a group of like 20 somethings, which you probably are. Let's just say this. Folks listening who listened to my episode with Alexis will know how I used to treat cabins when I went with groups of friends. So I know very intimately what groups of 20 somethings do to cabins while you're not there. Now we cleaned up after ourselves, but it was, I know what that could look like. Oh, I didn't even want to think about that. I put so much work into <laughs> now this he's stressed out. No, 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 none. I will say I've had parties, I've had groups, whatever. And like the extent of my damage is like someone fell on top of a poker table and broke it. Like, or they, you know, went into the hot tub dirty and we had to drain it or threw trash off the side of the, you, right? Like I don't have any horror stories of someone ruining my property. So I don't think you need to worry about your financial investment more just like it's easier for your cleaner. If they don't have to do extra work, it's easier for the property. Yeah. If they're, you know, it's just, don't worry excessively. Those are just my reasons for having <laughs> chosen Airbnb um, versus direct booking. But I'm not convinced that I'm right. So that's kind of why I ask about the direct booking side. I don't know what I'm missing. Yeah, and I what really do don't. Know. <laughs> yeah, you're learning. No, I, what... if you do, you guys have any more? Like, I guess what would be one of your main tips from a hosting side of things for not only like getting bookings, but just like being a good host? Like, even from like the little things you people notice when they, they walk into the home or whatever, or is, I guess, does anything pop into your mind right off the bat? I think hosting my dad is really helpful because he's open with feedback and he's experiencing it like a guest. So when he came to my cabin mm. the last time, um, he had a list of small things like, Hey, I really would have liked a hook on the back of my door to put my clothes. That's, you know, I usually find mm. that places and you didn't have one. I was like, Oh yeah good point. Or like having a friend or someone go and experience it as a guest and just have them give you, because guests will often hesitate to give you that kind of feedback because they don't want you to think that they didn't enjoy it. And the reality mm -hmm. is you can enjoy it and still give feedback on what would make it even better. So just really encouraging that feedback, friends and family, or having a feedback form for guests so that it's not on a review, but they can still give you that feedback is really helpful. Yeah. I think even in, hmm. in the beginning, awesome. like our Airbnb message. I think we even included like kind of boldly, like we're brand new and like we're open to any and all feedback. Like, please give us feedback. And a lot of people did like private notes. They just gave us some like things like, oh, hey, I, cool. I think if you had this or that. And I was like, oh, I didn't even think to put that there. Like, thanks. Like, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, the people are yeah. super helpful. I mean, these guests, the travelers, they'll, they'll definitely give you some valuable feedback yeah. for sure. But, and a good guest book hmm. that goes a long way for me. I spent most of my build working because I'd been a host before I definitely capitalized on the build time to work on all the hosting pieces. And I think my guest book is like 45 pages long, but not for the basics. Oh, the cool. basics are up front, but then there's like planned trips and like places to eat and QR codes for items in the cabin that people ask about. And it just does a lot of the work for you and it makes guests yeah. feel really cared about, but also for you, it just makes your life easier. Yeah, I just built out like a little form with all the QR codes on it. And I've filmed little videos all throughout the house. Like, here's the hot tub. Here's how this works. Like, here's yeah. how the steam shower works. That's just awesome. Yes, I saw you were doing that. I used to keep them on reels. I would like make reels of how to start things. But then now I use so many reels that they get buried. So putting it on a QR code mm. is so much smarter. I might steal that idea and do that for some of ours. I love it. Really good. I totally forgot it's a work day and it's 115. Justin and Sean, I'm so sorry. That's why we do 12 to 1. On I just weekdays. lost my job, Janice. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like we're gonna have to wrap it up. 
but I would love to chat again as you get closer to the next build and are starting that. If you uh, want to come Absolutely. on again and share with us some of that, we would love to chat more. Yeah, this has been awesome. I feel like it flew by so quick. It was great yeah. chatting with you guys. Yeah, it was great to meet on. you. Um, can you tell folks where they can find you? Because I know there's a lot of places. Yeah, so the main one is the Pacific Bin on Instagram. Um, it'll pull up if you type even Pacific Bin. Um, and then also YouTube. My goal for this year is to dive into YouTube and really start producing more on there. So you can find that at Devin Lorup on YouTube. So D-E-V-O-N-L-O-E-R-O-P. So yeah, that's it. And guys, you can find him on direct booking, maybe Airbnb and VRBO if you want to stay at the Pacific Bend. So if you're a listener on the West Coast, now is your time while there's still some openings because I suspect that is not going to be the case for long. So, so excited for you. Happy launch. Um, and I can't wait to hear more. Thank you, Thank you so much, guys. Great to meet you. Have a good yeah, weekend. Soon. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks so much for listening. And if you like what you heard, feel free to leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or share some of your favorite parts over on Apple Podcasts and a review. If you have any suggestions for guests or feedback, you can always find us on Instagram at Cozy Rock Gabin and The Chalet Frame, spelled C-H-A-L-A. See you next week, and thanks for joining us.